Hi, folks. This is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. Today, we're joined by my buddy, the Uber Jacked celebrity trainer, Rob Salaver. He's the creator of Bandana Training and the Nutrient Timing Plan, recently featured on ABC. If you've ever wondered about the value of timing your nutrients to your training plan, don't miss this show. Rob and I also see eye-to-eye on a lot of different things, so if you want to hear us geek out about some of the science behind this, you're going to like this one. Now, a bit of news before we get to it. I'm speaking at South by Southwest this year about my New York Times bestselling book, The Wild Diet, so if you're in town, please stop by and I'll sign it for you. I might even be giving out some home-baked cookies like I did last year, (laughs) so come hang out. My book, The Wild Diet, is finally back on Amazon and in stock in bookstores, so please check it out and leave me a review. I read every single one of them. Here's a tweet that just came in from Zach. Bought my stepdad a copy of your book for his 50th birthday last Saturday, and he is already down 11 pounds. Janine says, I have lost 70 pounds in three months with the Wild Diet. Smiley face. That's freaking awesome. Rock on, guys. Real food works. Please don't be shy. Uh, Tweet at me, write me a message on social media. I get back to as many as I can. Write me an email. I love hearing from you guys. And better yet, I'm going to be going around speaking a bunch this year. So please, if you're in the neighborhood and you see that I'm coming through, please come hang out. I'd love to meet you in person. Now, before we get to the show, check this out. You might know that my wife, Dog, and I have been traveling around North America and living out of state and national parks for a while now. And wherever you are, I can tell you firsthand, getting the highest quality real food can definitely be a challenge, especially if you don't want to break the bank. Lately, I've been getting a lot of questions like, Abel, how do I feed my family without going broke? Or how do I save time shopping for food? It takes forever. Or I'm on a budget. Where do I find the best real food for the least amount of money? Now, this is something that my wife and I have been doing together for years now. And we've put together a guide to show you exactly how to do that, get the best quality food if you're on a budget. And last month, we saved more than 300 bucks using these tips and strategies. So as a family, we've been doing this for years now. We've collected all of our favorite places to get the best quality meats and fresh produce and other foods for less. We put together a handy-dandy guide to help you save time and money on your grocery bill so you can get real food for less too. So in this guide, you'll learn money-saving shopping hacks that will cut your grocery budget by 30%. 50% or even more while enjoying the best quality meats, seafood, and fresh organic produce. Kitchen tricks to stretch your shopping dollar further than you ever thought possible. How to save time by knowing exactly where, when, and how to shop for your favorite food, snacks, and treats. Which brands of supplements, protein, and ingredients my wife and I trust, recommend, and use at home, and much more. And since we just launched the shopping guide, you can get it for a discount right now for less than 10 bucks. All you have to do is type in from any device, fatburningman.com slash shopping. This time-saving, money-saving guide will more than pay for itself on your first grocery bill. That's the idea anyway. If it doesn't, you get all your money back. So one of our readers, Tom, wrote in, your tricks for finding cheap meat and then how to make the most of it in the kitchen are priceless. For once, I'm actually excited to go to the supermarket to hunt for healthy bargains. So throw your food budget a bone and check out this guide today. Visit fatburningman.com slash shopping. All right, on to the show with my good buddy, Rob Slaver. On this episode, you'll learn how to time intake of carbs and protein for muscle recovery and optimal performance, why you don't need to count calories to drop fat, the difference between intermittent fasting and starving yourself, the importance of losing body fat instead of body weight, and much more. All right, let's go hang out with Rob. This episode is brought to you by Vital Choice. Vital Choice is a great place to get sustainably raised wild-caught seafood like Alaskan salmon, as well as halibut, tuna, cod, prawns, crab, scallops, and more. You'll also find grass-fed organic beef, live fermented foods to promote gut health, fresh frozen organic berries, and pasture-raised heritage chickens. And as a listener of Fat Burning Man, you can get a 10% discount to try their seafood for yourself. Just head over to vitalchoice.com and use the discount code WILDDIET, one word, at checkout. Thanks for listening. Here's the show. All right, folks. Rob Salaver has been named one of the top fitness experts in America by the Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, and Greatest. As a professionally trained actor at University of Michigan, 
athlete, Big Ten wrestler, and comedian, Upright Citizens Brigade, Rob tees up his extensive fitness and nutrition knowledge with a unique combination of on-camera ease, natural athletic ability, and giggles. Rob is also by far the sexiest man who has ever been on this show. Brosif, thanks so much for being here. <laughs> what an intro. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> Sexiest man ever? Come on. Sexiest man ever. Hey, I didn't say it. Shape did. <laughs> there you go, right? Like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't take it away from Shape, you know? So people listening and watching might know you from uh, ABC's My Diet is Better Than Yours, but you were almost cast on another reality show, which would have been an absolute travesty. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> sure, yeah, absolutely. I have been, you know, as you know, these kind of things, these opportunities come up and there's a whole kind of epic journey that you go through in the, in the casting process. So I've gone through that with a couple of different projects, but most recently I was out in LA for an NBC project and, you know, you do initial interviews and then you go back and forth and then you do, you know, Skype calls and you send them tons of material and there's a lot of back and forth and then... Even at that point, it's like final consideration and you go out and you do a screen test and you meet producers. And like I said, there's a, a huge journey to it. And uh, I'd gone through that whole thing and it looked like everything was going to happen and then it didn't work out. So I was devastated. Uh, I got on a plane. I came back to New York. You know, it's, it, it was rough because I, I was so close to, to something that I dreamed of for so long and then all of a sudden I wasn't. And it sucked. I uh, got on a plane, came back to uh, came back to New York from LA, and um, and that's actually the next day I, I started a conversation with ABC about this show, and yeah. uh, it was like a godsend. Uh, yeah, uh, and you just come rolling straight out with your big strapping muscles and whip Latasha right into shape. Uh, something like that, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, the show, uh, I mean, it was, it, it was crazy. But, like, getting there, I didn't know that I was going to be – you know, I got there the day before, and all yeah. this stuff is happening in real time. Right. So I didn't know I was going to be on the show right away. But then got the news the next day when Latasha decided to switch trainers, switch yeah. plans. And then it's been, a, it's been a wild ride since then. Yeah, it's been totally awesome. And I, I could tell when you when you came on, there are a lot of things that we agree about. You come from, you know, you, you're very accomplished in wrestling. You also know a heck of a lot about nutrition. Can you talk about the importance of, of marrying, basically, exercising the right way with nutrient timing and, and your whole approach to that? Yeah. The one thing I really loved about the nutrient timing plan is we got to highlight the relationship between exercise and yeah. nutrition, which is so important. You know, sometimes we talk about, like, in terms of body comp, one being more valuable than the other. And I get that. Like, I, I get the, this idea that we have to remind people to really focus in on their diet if they're focused more in on their training and vice versa. But the truth is I think they're both, like, absolutely necessary if, yeah. you, want to, uh, if you want to live an awesome life, if you want to have a, an awesome body, if you want to lose weight. So. So yeah, it's really the marriage of the two that ends up making the difference in terms of uh, dramatic body composition changes. Yeah, dramatic is is the word you want to highlight there because it's you know I think a lot of people get the wrong idea. They'll go and they'll hit the treadmill or whatever, and they're just like, I want to lose weight, and it doesn't really work exactly like that, right? I think you know when you look at people who get those transformations, a lot of times it might be a happy accident that they start working out and then they start thinking about nutrition because they're hungry at different times. Their body is kind of like working in a different way and they hone in on that. Same thing, when you start eating the right way, you might want to get out there, you have more energy, you can do a better workout, you want to work out, you're, more, you're feeling more positive. So what are some of the benefits uh, when it comes to actually like getting that workout? I don't know you say come into a workout a little bit hungry and then you refeed afterwards, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of, I think, counterintuitive to a lot of people because uh, in the past we've, we've talked about, or nutritionists have talked about fueling up before a workout. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this idea that you know, your, body, uh, your body is a gas tank and you've got to feed it gas before a workout in order to get through the workout. Mm -hmm. And the reality is like our metabolism in our body is, uh, isn't that short-sighted. Like it's, it's more, there's a much larger picture at play than this idea that we, we need 
carbs or fuel right before we exercise in order to, to have energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you've got to look at the big picture. You know, that's the truth with all of, all of our kind of metabolic science is like can zoom out and say like, what's the overall picture? Because that influences so much of the specifics. Yeah. Um, and certainly that's true with, with nutrient timing that, you know, consuming nutrients after your workout in your post-workout window uh, is one of the most valuable times to get nutrients in your body. So it's more a question of priorities than anything else. Yeah. So when you're, when you're coaching someone and say they're like intermediate level, what are you having them eat post-workout? So post-workout, a lot of times what we'll end up doing is kind of positioning all of, all of our carbs for the day post-workout. Okay. So I don't, I don't initially necessarily like change their carb intake unless it's wildly off. But what we end up doing is moving things around initially. So, and that's what nutrient timing is all about is that, that during, in this post-workout window, try to kind of move the bulk of your carbs. And people, it's amazing because people get great results without changing what they're eating during the day. They're just changing when they're eating stuff. Right. And it's a great first step. And again, you know, with so much of this stuff, I like to uh, shoot off a f couple of firecrackers and then basically kind of see how the body adapts mm -hmm. and then shoot off a few more and then see how the body adapts. So there's this constant process to it as opposed to this idea that you basically change everything, which I find to be too extreme and, and mm -hmm. uh, ends up kind of setting people up for failure or setting people up for like, uh, like what the hell just happened sort of yeah. What, what about the sources of carbs? I get this quite a lot from, from some people because you, you have very different camps, right? You have some people who are just like always keep it whole foods. You have other people who are taking you know, like dextrose and sugar powders and all this other stuff to get as ripped as possible. Where, where do you fall on that? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I focus, I tend to focus more on the whole food spectrum of things. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, um, I, I think we all need to rely more on whole, unprocessed, wild, natural foods. But uh, it depends on goals. So for some people, um, you know, I have some clients who are at the opposite end of the spectrum in that they're having trouble gaining weight. Right. Uh, and in that case, the kind of more processed supplementation type of food is, is super valuable mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's dense. And we need that kind of nutrient density in order to get the scale moving, basically, so that they mm -hmm. can pack on some, some pounds. So... More than anything, it's kind of uh, individual goals that dictate exactly what we're using. Yeah. But for the most part, I think most people can rely more on whole, unprocessed foods. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear that because a lot of people still have the wrong idea. They see someone who looks ripped, they work out in gyms or whatever, and they assume that they're taking all of these crazy supplements all the time. And so they go out and buy these things that are basically pure sugar. And they're like, why am I not getting results? It doesn't really work like that. Yeah. No, absolutely. And supplement, I mean, the supplementation world is so confusing. There's so much out there. Yeah. Uh, there's, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. It's just unregulated. Like it's still mm -hmm. the wild, wild west in many ways. And supplement companies can, can make all sorts of claims on their products that are or are not true. And as the consumer, it's hard to kind of decipher between what is legit and what is not legit. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I totally get that. And I do think, uh, while I do believe that supplementation can be valuable, I think our emphasis needs to be placed on good nutrition, quality yeah. nutrition, yeah. and supplementation needs to be just that, which is supplementation to an excellent nutrition plan. Yeah. So a lot of people, they'll write in, they'll ask me this question, especially around the, the nutrient timing thing or the, the carb timing thing. They're just like, well, when should I work out then? What's your answer to that? Yeah, well, that's, a, yeah that's a great question. Uh, and again, so much of this has to do with our overall lives. Yeah. Like that answer is given to us very often sure. because, because of you know, our career, because of our ob other obligations that we don't have as much control over. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel so fortunate in that I am able to kind of schedule my workout and then build my day around that. And so yeah. I work out in the, in the mid afternoon. Okay. And I love that because yeah. it's kind of the best of both worlds in that, you know, I'm not groggy or 
or uh, tight from the morning, mm-hmm. and I'm not exhausted from my day in the in the evening. So if you can make that happen, I found personally for me to to be the afternoon to be the most uh, beneficial time for me to work out. Yeah. But that said, if you can't, that's okay. <laughs> Like yeah. we work out when we can work out and then you can sort of build your schedule around that. Yeah. We've talked a little bit uh, in the past about intermittent fasting and sometimes that plays into the schedule as well because if you want to fast, I find it to be more effective um, not to fast after your workout. Uh, right. And that it, it's very hard to fast after your workout. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, if you're working out in the morning, fasting is a, it's just a harder thing to imp- implement. Whereas if you're working out in the afternoon or evening, I just find it makes more sense from a variety of angles uh, to include fasting in the program as well. So, yeah. so it's funny how all of these things sort of play into your schedule, and then ultimately it's sort of about building a schedule that works for you. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a great answer to the question, and I'll I'll just add on to that. A lot of times I will be doing fasting in the morning. So if I'm doing like Tabatas and it's just a quick workout to get my blood pumping, I usually don't worry about eating after that. I might have a little bit of fat. I might have some, you know, just like fish oil as a supplementation, but generally I I can get through that. I don't have to have that big refeed, but if I'm doing heavier lifts, if I'm doing, you know, deadlifts, squats, if I'm doing a longer type of workout, you really do get hungry and you'll get kind of foggy after the workout if you're not fueling. And so it's also, you know, delaying it until the mid afternoon. And I find that works really well, especially just from a a work-life balance perspective too. A lot of times, I'm just bored by that point of the day, right? It's like, sure, yeah, yeah. there are natural rhythms where I, usually I can crank in the morning, mid afternoon, I'm still going. And then just like two or three, it's not like I get that, that energy that escapes from you. Like a lot of people who are fueling with sugar or carbs throughout the day, you get that lull. It's more just like you've been working for quite some time. You want to get out there. Like I'm anxious to get outside or to hit the weights and just like get a workout going and then refeeding right after that. You've got either a late afternoon refeed or in the evening, and that seems to work really well. Yeah, what I've done in terms of like experimentation, and I've and I've done it all. Like I've worked out in the morning, I've worked out before work, I've worked out late at night after everything, mm-hmm. and it's this self experimentation that ultimately it has landed us both on the exact same schedule, which is kind yeah. of awesome. It's like when you kind of analyze what makes you feel best, then. It's cool that we get to the same the same answer because I feel the exact same way in that like I can crank in the morning, I can be super productive with my writing, with my online coaching, mm-hmm. I'm focused, and I think mentally I'm sharpest and I want to use that time on my business. Yeah. And then you kind of hit that lull where like your mental focus is starting to wane a little bit and that that workout kind of re energizes you. It does and yeah. then you get another chunk kind of in the afternoon. And what I end up doing is, is going into the gym, getting a solid workout in, refeeding at that point, and then uh, training my clients in the gym in the afternoon and okay. into the evening. Yeah, And that's how my kind of day is set up. So I'm spending half of the day on uh, online writing or online coaching. And then the second half of the day in the gym doing either uh, training sessions or nutrition coaching with clients. Yeah. Let me, let me just go ahead and say, uh, I've said this to you, Rob, but for all of those who are, who are listening, Rob is an excellent writer. It's hilarious. If you like fitness kind of conveyed in a fun way, check out his, his website. It's bandanatraining.com. But let me, let me just say, uh, you, you write about biochemical individuality. And that's something that a lot of people don't like to talk about because it really complicates things. But what are some things that have, you know, you, you've trained a lot of people. What surprised you as it relates to everyone being a little bit different? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's this idea that, like, you can give two people the exact same program and they can respond to it very differently. Yeah. So then, you know, you, you say, well, it's not the program, like, right? It's the people who are doing the program. Mm-hmm. And so much of my coaching and so much of my advice is also so much about listening, about listening to the feedback that you're getting from either your client or from your own body mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, how you look, how you feel, and how you perform. Because that's so important because there are there, – the reality is there, there's a million different ways to do this stuff. And if you found a way that makes you perform well and, and look great and 
makes you happy as hell, then you're doing it right. There's no question about that. And so we have to, you know, the self-experimentation is so important because of bio-individuality, because we all respond differently to the exact same stimulus. Mm -hmm. So, okay, one thing, we do have some people who write in and they're just like, I'm a hard gainer. And they don't always get great advice because most advice is kind of, especially you find on the internet or in the media, it's all about fat loss, right? What do you say for someone who's who's a hard gainer? What are some things that they can do if they want to improve their physique? Yeah. Well, so the first thing I do is sympathize with them, which they don't get very often because, you know, most people are like, oh, you're so damn lucky because, you know, a lot of people are, are trying to lose weight. But the reality is that hard gainers have it just like they have the the body, the same body envy that that uh, endomorphs have in terms of like looking at other people and saying, man, I wish I could do that. Mm-hmm. And it's just as challenging for them to gain weight as it is for the endomorphs to lose weight. Yeah. So I think that's nice for them to hear because often they don't get that. And then from there, you know, it, it, it's just – it's that reminder that their commitment to nutrition has to be just as strong as the endomorphs and that they have to like really focus on eating – and eating consistently and, you know, and, and layering food, basically like figuring out how to slip in more calories, more fat, more carbs mm-hmm. than they might otherwise want to uh, in order to get the scale moving. So, again, using progress as your, as your barometer and then saying, what do I have to do to accomplish this progress? And so, you know, I encourage them to to use the scale and and to know, like, if the scale isn't moving, they're not adding the mass that they want to add and then making adjustments from there. Yeah. Let's talk about this because I recently read one of your articles about variety and CrossFit versus some of your training, which I just, I loved your perspective on that. So variety, it's a double-edged sword, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just this idea that there is a sweet spot for variety. I think that anymore the culture that we're we're in is just inundated with variety. Like we have mm-hmm. access to any trainer you want on the internet, any nutrition plan, any new gadget. Like we have access to the entire world and to an entire spectrum of options. And mm-hmm. so that creates a little bit of chaos. And what ends up happening is uh it, is we kind of value variety over what I think we should value, which isn't so much what is different, but it's what is best or what is better. And so the article talks a lot about, uh, in terms of our fitness and our nutrition plans, I think that our master should be progress. We should look towards progress as ultimately what we're trying to accomplish instead of looking towards variety as what we're trying to accomplish. Because I think a lot of people from their fitness routine or even their nutrition plan, they want something different, like always different, mix it up, mix it up, mix it up. Mm-hmm. And if that comes at the cost of progress, I, I, I argue that that's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people, they don't necessarily know what they're training. Let me ask you this, because you do train so many people, like what are people training for? Cause that's so important, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, so figuring out what your, what your specific goals are, I think. Yeah. Is the step. I love this idea that just kind of reminds me of this concept of like uh, treating like normal life as a professional athlete would. So like approaching, it's kind of how I train. It's like, I'm not training to wrestle anymore. I'm not training to compete. I'm not training to even run a marathon or anything Mm -hmm. like that. I'm training to live the most awesome life that I can possibly live. Yeah. And so to me, that's that's a pretty damn good goal. Yeah. It's just a little bit more elusive than something like I want to run a marathon or I want to, you know, compete in the CrossFit games. But I love that idea. I love that like treating life like a professional athlete and training accordingly is kind of how I approach things. Yeah. So you can't have uh, a goal to be as big as possible and maximize maximize longevity at the same time, right? How are these goals like contrary to each other at some points? So, well, wait, wait, say that again. So in terms of like getting just kind of... Yeah, so for example, some people walk into a gym, they might not know exactly what they want. They, maybe they want to look like Schwarzenegger <laughs> or something yeah, yeah. like that. 
or you could just want to be healthy and have a little bit more energy. How would you adjust training on both sides? Because some people don't really know the difference between those things. Yeah, 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 sure. That's a good question. I mean, I think that I love this idea of phase training. So Mm -hmm. with my phase training, and usually I break them up into what I call meso phases or about like one month blocks four or five week blocks. Yeah. And so the beauty of that is that you can kind of shift your emphasis on a block to block basis. So, you know, if one block is a hypertrophy block where you're really trying to get bigger, uh, that's great. And that gives you kind of that very specific focus for that meso phase. And then maybe you can move on and, uh, you know, it might be more kind of a a general physical preparation phase Mm -hmm. or more like I want to feel good, I want to have more energy phase. And then uh, you might move on to a a, a body composition phase or a fat loss phase. And so you're like constantly moving through um, a variety of specific goals. And that really allows you to keep your training fresh because you're not, you know, constantly trying to say like, I just want to get bigger. I just want to get bigger. I just want to get bigger. And then things get a little mundane. Right. And so a lot of people, they kind of, they have those goals, but they don't necessarily pay attention to something that I know you pay attention to, which is body composition. So they're looking at, at the scale and that's kind of it, right? But what you really want to look at is mu- muscle gain or loss, fat gain or loss, right? And then there's the whole water thing or whatever, but basically, so how can you get people to focus on the right things when it comes to body composition, specifically fat and muscle? Sure. I mean, that still is such a, like, we have to make that shift. In terms of the national conversation on health and fitness, we have to make the shift away from the scale towards body composition, towards, uh, you know, percentage of body fat even would be a better number than just the scale weight. Because as we both know, the, you know, the same weight can look very, very differently on two different bodies. Yeah. I mean, it's just about education. It's about reminding, you know, teaching people ultimately that certain numbers matter more than other numbers and mm-hmm. that we need to get away from, uh, you know, BMI and, and scale and need to move yeah. on towards just more intelligent metrics. Right. And you can burn muscle if you try to lose weight too quickly. And a lot of people do that, especially if, if you go for like the chronic cardio route. Even myself, when I was running marathons, I was uh, I was at like 148, and normally I'm like 165, 170, and I feel a lot better up there. But if you're if you're overtraining, if you're not fueling correctly, you can get really small. You can sacrifice a lot of muscle. So, w- what can you do to prevent that? Yeah, you know, resistance training with runners is a huge topic, and mm-hmm. I feel like is uh, is often neglected. Yeah. You know, runners love to run. They, they just run and they keep running and they keep going. And even if they have an injury, they, they keep running. And I know because I'm a runner yeah. and I deal with injuries and sometimes I run through them and it's terrible because running like you love running. I love running. It's so wonderful. Right. But to add that resistance training into the equation, into your overall plan to figure out how you can possibly slip that in there makes a big difference. Not only in terms of your your body composition and your lean mass, but also in terms of your running. Like it makes yeah. you a better runner. Right. So, and the only reason that I think people often don't is because they're just not as comfortable in the weight room. Yeah. And that's been you know that's a kind of a constant goal of mine is how do I how do I educate people? How do I get people comfortable in the weight room so that this can be a part of their everyday lives? Because I know it can be intimidating to walk into a gym. Or to be a part of the gym, especially yeah. when you don't really know what the hell's going on. Yeah. So what are some exercises that you would recommend, especially for runners just getting started? Being a runner yourself, because you don't have the typical like runner's physique. Right. Yeah. So, so much of, well, a, a, a couple things. One, like your overall programming is important because it's hard to pound the legs too hard in the weight room when your running volume is high. Yeah. And I know because I try and, and then you go on runs and you know, you're, you're not feeling as good with your running because yeah. you just squatted heavy or mm-hmm. you did he- heavy deads or heavy lunges, all of which I think are super important for a runner, but you just have to be smart about the overall programming. So basically the way I look at it is the closer you are to race day, the less leg specific stuff you're doing in the weight room. Yeah. Um, Just because, again, you're preserving your legs for your running, which is most important. And that goes for any programming. Like the closer you get to competition, 
the more you want to focus on the competition, like what yeah. you're doing for the competition. Mm-hmm. But it's the immediate after and the phases that kind of follow a race where you have to rely more on resistance training and the big business lower body exercises like squats, lunges, deadlifts, split squats in order to maintain that mass to keep your legs nice and strong and to help prevent injury and keep them nice and durable. And then again, it's that kind of gradual shift from resistance training to more and more high volume running training, depending on your goals and whatnot. But that's the general trend is a, is a heavy kind of resistance block with some running that transitions to a heavy running block with some resistance training that gets into your competition. Does that that. make sense? Yeah, it definitely does. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about calories. Because I know you don't like right. them very much. You say it's important to understand calories. Counting them is not cool. <laughs> Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, calories, I think it's great to understand everything. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, geeking out about this stuff I think is wonderful. And I'll also say that one of the best ways to eat well is to study nutrition, to become a mm-hmm. student of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Because there's nothing that makes you change your habits faster than getting into the nitty gritty and being like, holy shit, that's what happens when I eat this food or that's what factory farms are all about. So the more yeah. we can educate ourselves, the more, uh, the more that really helps change our habits. Yeah. In terms of calories specifically, yeah, I just don't think calorie counting is accurate. I don't think, mm-hmm. I think that's, it's enslaving. It makes people kind of uh, obsess about food and ultimately it turns it into a math equation or a science project. And yeah. as we would both agree, I think that food is so much more awesome than a numbers game. Yeah. So I think food should be, should be delicious and fun and social mm-hmm. and like all of the wonderful things that food is. So it, it shouldn't be a, a math problem. Yeah. Now what about the idea that you can lose fat and gain muscle at the same time? Yeah. So yeah, I've seen it happen. I mean, I know that it can happen in terms of like metabolically, we often talk about, you know, we talk about anabolic and catabolic Mm -hmm. and how, you know, the body has anabolic processes and catabolic processes. And the reality is like those can both happen. Like the body isn't always either anabolic or catabolic. These things Mm -hmm. are all happening at the same time. Sure. So you could sit, you could argue that like overall, the body is in a more catabolic state or a more anabolic state, but that doesn't mean that these, the, that the metabolic processes are not both happening individually. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Building muscle, losing fat at the same time. A lot of people are just like, well, you, you can't do that. But you know, when you see it up close and personal, or when you see someone who's able to lose fat selectively, like working with Kurt on the show, he, he was someone who couldn't necessarily exercise that much. He couldn't run that much. So I wanted to, at all costs, make sure that he was preserving that lean mass, preserving that muscle, because that's the best fat-burning engine that you have. It's amazing for your metabolism. If you're burning off muscle, it's bad news. So there, there are certain things that you can do to make sure that you're either maintaining or maybe even building muscle while losing fat in particular. Because if you're just, you know, going back to the calories in, calories out thing, if you're starving yourself, if you're under eating and you go out running like a lot of people do, you're basically just burning off muscle. And a lot of people like exercise the wrong way, put fat on after that because they're not fueling correctly. But when you start doing it strategically, especially when you, when you focus on your macros, you do some resistance training, you can lean down in some pretty remarkable ways. And I know on your blog, you have like, I think it was like three dudes who trained in different ways. One of them lost the most most fat. Can you talk a little, a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, and it was very similar to what you were just saying in that you're focusing one, you know, one part of the equation is the diet and kind of Mm -hmm. manipulating your macronutrients so that you're preserving your lean mass as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. then the other uh, part of the equation is your training. And when you rely more on resistance training, and less on this 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 idea that you know get on the cardio machine and burn calories, mm-hmm. you end up preserving this lean mass because you're stimulating you know its growth basically the whole time. Yeah. So that's sort of the game, and it, you know the the blog post illustrates it well in that the the guy who was doing cardio the whole time 
uh, his body would look very similar from the beginning to the end. He just shrunk. Everything got yeah. smaller. And for some people, maybe that's what they want. And I have no problem with that. Like if mm-hmm. that's what you want your body to look like, then train accordingly or you know, eat accordingly. Mm-hmm. But for a lot of us, I think we underestimate how good a body looks when we conserve or create a little bit of lean mass and then really reduce the body fat. Yeah. Uh, especially women. Like I would say that women underestimate how good they look when they add a few pounds of muscle and get lean. To me, that is the sort of sexy uh, Hollywood body that a lot of girls are looking for. They just mm-hmm. don't necessarily recognize it as that. Yeah, because it puts mass or it puts muscle in the right places, right? Fat goes in the wrong places a lot of the time. But especially for women, when you, when you put on muscle, it looks really good. Yeah, no, exactly right. And uh, yeah, and I just think that there's like that again, like we have to shift that conversation towards this idea that resistance training is super valuable, that mm-hmm. that uh, women look awesome when they lift and that it's empowering. I love that, yeah. you know, Natasha and I got to yeah. talk a lot about, about that because, uh, you know, on the show, this is the first time that Natasha really starts to, to lift. Like she's never really right. lifted before. Yeah. And so this is she it's wearing a, her pearls during the lifting too. Uh, yeah, I think she, <laughs> I don't think she ever took those off. Like I think she slept with those pearls. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so it, women end up feeling strong. They end up feeling very capable, and that's yeah. another big component of weightlifting. It makes us more capable, and so that's awesome to me. Like what, what, this idea that that girls can be super strong to mm-hmm. me is is like hell yes. Let's make that yeah. happen. It, it's so awesome. You know, when I met my wife, Allison, she was doing kind of the chronic cardio thing and, and a lot of it, like a lot of times twice a day, two hours on the treadmill. These days, she's a lot more strength based and does things like kettlebells. And I can tell you when she wakes up in the morning and she's doing kettlebells, it makes me want to work out so bad. And it's one of those awesome things that happens when you see someone doing something positive around you. It makes you want to be better. So how can you... When you're training someone, how can you make sure that they're not being pulled down by the proverbial crabs who want them to, you know, stay miserable in in their own little box as opposed to really being that light that can help other people live health? Yeah. Yeah, man, that's huge. I mean, I think just continuing to be a positive role model for them. I look at both of us like we live and breathe this stuff. This is so this is yeah. about so much more than just a business. Like this really is our lives. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, like just kind of continuing to be that role model for them to look at uh, fitness and to look at nutrition as the base, as the foundation for a really awesome life yeah. is what this stuff is all about to me. But yeah, it's so important, our social circle. Sometimes I talk about that specifically with, with my clients in that like, what's the saying? Like, it's not you all what you eat, it's you all what your friends eat or you yeah. all what your loved ones eat. Yeah. And that like, that's how profound our social circle is on our, on our food, on our training, mm-hmm. on our lifestyle. You have to look at those barriers a lot of times when you're, when you're hoping to make some dramatic changes in your life because sometimes it is our, our circle that is tough. Like that is a, that's a, that's a bit of a, a roadblock and we have to kind of figure out ways to, to manage that or improve it or to make that align with our, our new goals and our, our new lifestyle. Yeah. So how do you eat every day? What does a typical Rob meal look like? Um, yeah. So I've been playing around. I mean, I play around with food. Uh, yeah. in that, like, I'm constantly trying new nutrition plans, new diets. Uh, right now, I mean, I, I, I fast occasionally. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not sort of a hot – it's not like a – a uh, super rigid uh, schedule, yeah. but because a lot of it takes into account also like social events and like big dinners out and big like bro meals. Yeah. And then I find that uh, like the post big bro dinner, steak dinner fast is also super helpful for me to kind of keep uh, the energy influx and balance. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I'm constantly playing around with stuff and then writing about it or you know, thinking about writing about it because that's how you, I feel like the self-experimentation is kind of at the basis of a, a lot of what I'm doing. Yeah. But generally speaking right now, um, I have my coffee in the morning with my coconut oil, my stevia, 
And then I'll usually, I'll work in the, you know, that morning block and then I'll have my BCAs before my workout. I'll hit a hard workout kind of in the early afternoon or late morning. Uh, and then I have my first big meal, uh, which is usually kind of breakfasty and includes, you know, eggs and vegetables and some starches. Nice. Yeah. And then from there, it's kind of a, a, a pretty normal routine, I'd say. But yeah, I eat very whole, unprocessed, uh, natural foods. That's kind of, for the most part, what makes up the bulk of my my nutrition plan. And a heavy emphasis more and more on vegetables and how awesome they are and how much fun we can have with them and like all the varieties of ways in which we can make them uh, flavorful and delicious. I think you said vegetables are the raddest thing on earth or something like that. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Uh, I can't, yeah, I mean, more and more, I, I do think that we need to start thinking of vegetables as sort of the centerpiece yeah. as opposed to protein. I'm a huge, I'm a, like a dedicated carnivore, but yeah. just in terms of our overall health, most people who eat meat eat enough meat <laughs> or yeah, eat, right. yeah, so that like I think it's just beneficial for me to talk a little bit more about the importance of vegetables mm-hmm. because I think we all do ourselves a big favor by eating more vegetables than we do. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I've said it many times, but after interviewing like two hundred plus of the world's top experts who disagree about everything, they all agree that we should all be eating more vegetables. Vegetables are awesome. They're a secret weapon. I do it every single day. And it's something that you feel too. You know, at first you're just like, oh my God, I'm eating vegetables. But once your body gets used to it and links how you feel later to actually eating them, you you start to crave. I get cranky when I don't have vegetables at this point. <laughs> Honestly, I feel the exact same way. So when I, you know, when I travel or go home or, or I'm outside of my normal routine and have a little less control over my nutrition plan, mm-hmm. I feel it. I'm like, man, like I don't get this, these same sort of, nutrients that I get from my, you know, my, my vegetable heavy diet, uh, at home. And so I, I'm the same way. Like I get cranky and I get super eager to get back to my routine, yeah, which right. is so vegetable centric, but yeah, it's amazing. I mean, like, you know, when you travel or when you kind of get outside of the routine and you notice how the rest of the, the country or the rest of the world is eating, sometimes it's, it's a surprise, you know, and you're yeah. like, we've got to, we've got to, continue to educate people and kind of remind them of the importance of this stuff. We still have plenty of work to do, Rob. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's, that's the other thing, you know, that, that excites me so much about this, this show and this opportunity and meeting yeah. you and geeking out about what we both geek out about is like, I've never felt in competition with other awesome, smart, like brilliant uh, coaches like you, because there, there's an entire world of people that need our help. Yeah. It's like, we're, we're on the same team. As yeah, far as totally. I'm concerned. Even on the show, like, we're on the same team. Ultimately, it's us against, uh, you know, metabolic syndrome. It's us right. against obesity. It's us mm-hmm. against all that other crap. It's not us against each other. And so yeah. I'm always trying to kind of steer the conversation towards that, which is like we're fighting the same battle. Yeah, we are. And we agree about pretty much everything. Yeah, I mean, is there, I don't think there's anything that we have yet. As much as it could be spun in a different way, we, we definitely see eye to eye on this. And you have to because there were principles about health that are just ultimately true. Yeah, I, absolutely. You know, it's funny. I don't know if, I, I think I can talk about this, but basically the first plan that I pitched on yeah. My Diet is Better Than Yours is sort of in line with my Shred Kitchen, which is, which was, basically, which was very similar to what you had yeah, done right. on the show. <laughs> and so they were like, no, you can't do that. Like, we already had that on the show. And I was like, yeah. okay, let's regroup and right. try to highlight something else that still feels authentic to me. Mm-hmm. But this idea that, you know, the through line to good nutrition, there's more that unites us than divides us, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so while the show and media in general – likes to be more divisive, I think that that there's more similarities to us than than I think people m- might initially realize with something like my dad is putting like. Yeah, and I think people are starting starting to get the picture. And also when you're watching reality TV, I think most people realize that they're, they're watching reality TV and, and, and the word reality is used very uh <laughs> they're generous with 
<laughs> with the definition of that word. <laughs> but it's all in good fun, and it's been uh, such a pleasure working with you, Rob. Um, you're an all star. You you freaking rock. Um, please tell folks out there where they can find you and what you're working on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I just launched my my nutrition my new nutrition guide, uh, which is called Shred Kitchen. All of my guides are available at bandanatraining.com slash guides. But check out the blog. You know, like read, there's a ton of free information up there. My newsletter is available at bandanatraining.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. You get a free hormone report, which talks about kind of the hormone approach to our life, to health, uh, which to me is, is kind of way cooler than the, the calorie approach, which is yeah. old school. Yeah. Yeah, so all of it's available at bandanatraining.com, and I'm all over the internet on social media, so hit me up. I love this stuff. I geek out about this stuff, so I'm always happy to help. Awesome. Rob, you're freaking awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. You have to come back. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for having me. And like I said, uh, dude, just the chance to work with you and kind of geek out about this stuff with you has been, has been remarkable, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Do you want to know how we saved more than 300 bucks on our grocery bill last month? If you've ever wondered, how can I feed my family real food on a budget? What cuts of meat are the best value? Which brand of almond flour works best for baking? What's the best coconut oil to use? Where can I buy locally raised beef and poultry for half price? Well, we just created a handy dandy guide to help you save time and money on your grocery bill so you can get your family the highest quality real food they deserve on any budget. In this guide, you'll learn how to save time by knowing exactly where, when, and how to shop for your favorite foods, snacks, and treats, which brands of supplements, protein, and ingredients we trust, recommend, and use at home, money-saving shopping hacks that will cut your grocery budget by 30%, 50% or even more while enjoying the best quality meats, seafood, and fresh organic produce, how to reduce food waste in your kitchen to stretch your food dollar farther than you ever thought possible, and much more. And since we just launched the shopping guide, you can get a discount to grab it for less than 10 bucks. All you have to do is type in from any device, fatburningman.com slash shopping. That's fatburningman.com slash shopping. See you there. This episode was brought to you by Vital Choice. Vital Choice is a great source for sustainably raised, wild-caught seafood. They also ship grass-fed organic beef, pastured heritage chickens, and even dark chocolate straight to your door. And as a listener of Fat-Burning Man, you can get a 10% discount to try their seafood for yourself. Just head over to vitalchoice.com and use the discount code WILDDIET at checkout. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? Please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you, and if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or FatBurningMan. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com I'll give you a second to type it in fatburningman.com and you'll get all the show notes and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man better yet enter your best email at fatburningman.com sign up for my newsletter and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now. Enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week.